Now, one of the recurrent questions has been, why would God do this? And, uh, and I suppose that's a very good question. We can speculate. Uh, the, the first question, though, is to find out what was done, get the data right. And, uh, and then you can say, well, this phenomenon occurs, then we can speculate as to why. But uh, I've heard some people who seem to get the cart before the horse who say, well, I can't think of any reason why God would do that, therefore it must not be really there. Well, that's not a very scientific question or a very scientific approach. You look to see, first of all, what the phenomena are, what the data is, and, and then you think about why. Um, but that is the natural question. It's the question that I have um, and would like to know an answer to. It will proceed. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jan Martin. Jan Martin was born in San Diego and spent her childhood in Arizona and New Mexico, but she considers Utah her home state. She earned a bachelor's degree in physical education and a master's degree in exercise physiology from Brigham Young University, along with a teaching minor in German. And then she changed directions somewhat, earning a master's degree in early modern history at the University of York in the north of England. Continuing in the Department of History there at York, uh, she next completed a doctorate with an emphasis on 16th century English Bible translation. She's currently an assistant, <laughs> assistant visiting professor at BYU. Uh, Dr. Martin's presentation is entitled Charity, Priest, and Church versus Love, Elder, and Congregation, the Book of Mormon's connection to the debate between William Tyndall and uh, Thomas More. Dr. Martin. Good morning, everyone. I'm very honored to be here. It's nice to see the room so full, and I hope to make your time worthwhile. Um, I apologize for the way that I sound. I've not been very well the last few days, and I'm just really grateful that I'm here. Um, <laughs> we prayed a lot to make sure that I could get here today, and uh, our prayers have been answered. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to two of my favorite people, Thomas Moore and William Tyndale, and the debate that they had in the 16th or 1500s, um, over translation issues and how the Book of Mormon actually engages very well with this. Now, Alexander Campbell, <clears throat> in 1831, he published a book, a pamphlet, entitled Delusions, an Analysis of the Book of Mormon. Now, Alexander Campbell was the founder of Disciples of Christ Church. He was a leader, a uh, religious leader, in the early 19th century and led this movement called the Restoration Movement. Uh, so he was quite influential, and uh, this pamphlet was written to expose Joseph Smith as an impudent knave who had written a fantastical romance and was trying to pass it off as a Bible. Um, and so in this pamphlet, he uh, tries to come up with the reasons why the Book of Mormon is a fabrication. And one of his uh, attacks is on the language, and I think Stan Carmack's done a good job uh, starting to look at some of the grammar. Um, but he just assumed that the Book of Mormon was a patched up, cemented, and it came to pass with, I saith unto you, ye saith unto him, and all the King James hath dids and doth, in the lowest imitation of the common version. And hopefully Stan has kind of blown that out of the water already today, and we're going to do some more of that uh, later. But he also attacks the theology of the Book of Mormon, and he says, every error and almost every truth discussed in New York for the last 10 years is just thrown in there, as if Joseph's copying what's going on around him. And so he then basically summarizes it to say that the Book of Mormon is a hodgepodge of Smithsisms, and it must be considered the meanest book in the English language. Um, so whether we like those criticisms or not, um, they're a brilliant platform to have a look at the language of the Book of Mormon and the theology. Now, many of us hopefully know this. It's very difficult to separate theology from language. Um, and Campbell should have known this better than anyone. He was a theologian himself as well as a Bible translator. In fact, he was the first person to try and update the King James Bible 
in the 1800s, and he published his own translation of it, trying to modernize the language. Um, and he incorporated some of his own theological ideas in that translation. Um, so he knew this, and the way he passes off the Book of Mormon so superficially is really unfortunate. But it says something about the fact that he didn't give it any time, didn't have a look at it. Um, so <clears throat> I just want to show you what modern researchers know about this. Brian Cummings is one of our leading English uh, historians of the language. And he said, the creation of a vernacular translation of the Bible embodies within it the creation of vernacular theology. So as we look at language, we have to look at theology at the same time. But somebody else knew this long before Brian Cummings came on the scene. William Tyndale said, God is not man's imagination, but that which only which he saith of himself. God is but his word. God is, the, is that only which he testifieth of himself. Tyndale understood this connection, that you've got to get the language right if you're going to get the theology right. So let's have a look at some words. Now, words do not have equal value, and Stan's done a great job this morning of looking at syntax and grammar, but we're going to take it further and actually look at meanings and theology. So let me just show you some words that are theologically significant, that um, imply something religious when you use them. Priest and elder, for example. Love and charity. Congregation and church. Penance or repentance. Grace or is it favor? Knowledge or is it confession? They all mean something different and they all stand for some practices that are slightly um, in agreement or disagreement with each other. So it's important for us to recognize that we're going to look at some of these words today and then attach the theology to them and let you see what the Book of Mormon has to say. So the question we're going to ask is, what does the language and theology of the Book of Mormon tell us about its origins? We're going to focus on six of these words up here on the top, um, just because we don't have time to do all of them, um, just to give you a sample. What I'm going to suggest to you today is that the philological, which means language, okay, and theological complexities in the Book of Mormon are a lot older than the 19th century. Alexander Campbell got it wrong, uh, and I'd like to show you why that is. Um, so let's talk a little bit about 16th century controversies over Bible translation. Um, <clears throat> This controversy was initiated between William Tyndale and Thomas More. Hopefully you've heard of them before. Uh, William Tyndale is the martyred English scholar and religious reformer. He was the first person to translate the New Testament into English from the original Greek. He was also the first person to translate the Old Testament into English from the original Hebrew. Now, as you can see, he did not do the whole Old Testament. He didn't live long enough to do it, which is a shame, because I would have loved to have a Tyndale Isaiah, okay? Um, <laughs> he was a master of English, and um, the King James translators didn't do such a good job, and I think Tyndale would have done much better than that. But we've got some of his things from the Old Testament. Now, in a minute, I'll talk about this publication um, when we bring in Thomas More. But Tyndale published a lot of other things, a lot of polemic religious writings in addition to his Bible translations. Now, Thomas More was an experienced English lawyer. He's also the famous author of Utopia. That kind of made him famous in the humanist world there of the uh, 16th century. He was a counselor to Henry VIII for many years and served as Lord <laughs> Chancellor for a few years at the top of his career. He then resigned because of Henry's divorce issues and how uh, Thomas More could not support those decisions. Um, Thomas More was an opponent of Tyndale's translations. He wrote a dialogue concerning heresies against Martin Luther and William Tyndale and a bunch of other reformers. And then up here, Tyndale responds with an answer to Sir Thomas More. And then Thomas More writes back to Tyndale with a confutation of Tyndale's answer. It's two volumes, and it's a million words, you guys. This answer was, he just tried to bury Tyndale, but you can't even read the thing. You know, it just goes on for too long. <laughs> so that's what we've got going on with our debate here. Now, what Thomas More had to say to Tyndale was, 
that he knew that errors of language, even if they're slight, can become really major theological errors. And so he takes Tyndale to task for his 1526 translation of the New Testament and accuses him of making some spiritually dangerous linguistic mistakes that lead to these theological mistakes. And Moore believed that Tyndale's errors were so subtle that the poor people couldn't understand that they were there, and so he took it upon himself to point them out. So what he does is he reveals these errors by focusing on some words. And we're going to pick three of the words, the Greek words he, he had a problem with. Presbyteros, meaning an older man. Ecclesia, meaning called out ones. And agape, uh, which typically means love. And he took Tyndale to task over the way he translated these. Now, Tyndale, in his first translation of the Bible, decided that presbyteros was uh, good to be expressed in English as senior. But then later on, he decided that wasn't a good word and he permanently changes it to elder. Um, and then Chan Tyndale also translated this ecclesia as congregation, and he translates agape as love. Moore was upset because he thought presbytero should be translated as priest, that ecclesia should always be translated as church, and that agape should be translated as charity. Now, the reason Moore was so upset about these is because Three very important theological articles of the Catholic faith are built upon these words. The first one, obviously, is the holy order of the priesthood. If you take that away, what have you done? The second one is obviously the authority and organization of the Catholic Church all the way down from Christ. If you take this church organization away, what do you have? And then charity has to do with the giving of alms, including the charitable work for the dead and for people in purgatory and stuff like that. And if you take that away, you've really damaged um, the Catholic Church. And he was really upset about that. Um, and he accused Tyndale of doing it on purpose um, and trying to destroy the church with his Bible translations. So Tyndale obviously didn't agree and said he did it with good conscience and good uh, translation skills and maintained his position. Now, some of you will probably know that this debate was not resolved in their lifetime. They were both executed in the mid-1530s 18 or 1530s, uh, for sticking to their beliefs and their resolve. They never got these resolved. Um, but what's fascinating is the Book of Mormon, though it is a 19th century text, actually interacts with this debate in a very remarkable way. So let's have a look and let you see what happens. As we said, presbyteros literally means an older man. <coughs> Tyndale starts off with senior, but he changes it to elder. He believed that the Greek word presbyteros only represented age and experience, not a consecrated or setting apart individual to a priest office. Okay, he didn't see any divine authority or power in that word. And he really looked at the text and felt that these men were chosen by their congregations. They didn't just join a a clerical job, um, and they performed sacred ceremonies to help their congregations, and that's all. Um, and he felt that their main responsibility was to teach the Word of God. And he did not like the way the Catholics had these priests standing in between uh, the worshiper and God. Um, he didn't think they were mediators, and so he preferred the word elder because theologically it matched all those things. Now, Moore obviously wanted priest because he felt presbytero signified authority in a consecrated office, and he got that just from Catholic tradition. And Moore was a big traditionalist, and so he got really annoyed when you tossed tradition out. Um, he also felt that presbytero, so that word, signified divine authority and power that was given by the laying on of hands, and that these priests performed sacred rites and ceremonies in behalf of their parishioners and were mediators between God and man. Oh, sorry. And so you have this polarized position with presbyteros here um, in what it means. Now, <clears throat> Tyndale obviously took priest out of his New Testament totally and had elder everywhere. So let's show you what happened to these words in later translations of the English Bible. What's so fascinating is that nobody followed Thomas More. 
Now, one of the translators of the later editions, now Coverdale Bible is 1537, Matthew Bible, Great Bible, Geneva Bible. We all go all the way up to 1611 with the King James Bible. And Presbyteros appears 67 instances in the Greek text. And all these translators translated into Elder 64 of those times. And you might be wondering what happened to the other three times. Um, but it's translated as old man, um, eldest, and old men. So there's no priest anywhere in there. Okay, now what's fascinating is all these translators of these Bibles are Protestant. So that shouldn't surprise us because there are Protestant doctrinal uh, supporters there. But when we get over here to the 1580s, we have our very first Catholic translation of the New Testament. It took the Catholic Church a long time to come around to believing that an English translation was good for their people, but they finally do one. And what's even more amazing is they even translate presbyteros into the word ancient. They don't even use the word priest. Um, so Thomas More might have been a bit upset, okay, <laughs> that nobody's following his advice and nobody's taking his position about this word. Um, and you might kind of get an idea that elder becomes the favorite word, and it is. But what's fascinating is when you actually start looking at the conversations that are going on about this word, Tyndale himself sets the stage for this compromise of what happens in the meaning. Um, in a book he published, Obedience of a Christian Man of 1528, um, he said, by priest in the New Testament, understand nothing but an elder. And the elders are supposed to teach young men and bring them up into the full knowledge and understanding of Christ's gospel. Later on, when he revised his New Testament translation of 1534, in the prologue, he said it again. He said, it didn't matter to him whether presbyteros was translated as elder or priest, as long as readers understood that the purpose of the position, no matter what you called it, was to be a servant of the word of God and to administer sacraments and nothing more. And this is what's happened today in most Protestant circles. Priest and elder typically mean the same thing. Um, so it's quite fascinating to see what's happened here. Now, what does the Book of Mormon do with these words? Let me show you. Priest and elder, look at that. Okay, priest, 105 times. Elder appears actually 17 times. Um, but eight of those times, it's only talking about elder siblings. And so it's not talking about somebody in a, an office of serving anyone else. So we've only got nine times where it's actually used there. Um, but what's fascinating is you use the word priest and elder under the law of Moses. And you also have priest and elder being used when Christ comes and restores the higher law. So there's no differentiation in offices in the English of the Book of Mormon. Now, obviously, we don't have the Reformed Egyptian to go back and check and see if there's different words from Law of Moses to the higher law being used. Um, but the English is the same across the board, which is uh, fascinating. Now, <clears throat> let me just give you a couple examples. Under the Law of Moses, Alma 6.1, we get ordaining of priests and elders by the laying on of hands. And then later on, Moroni, who's under the higher law, says the manner which disciples who were called elders of the church are ordained priests and teachers. So you can see both of them being used. They're distinct offices. They're separate things in the Book of Mormon in both of the gospel laws that are being lived there. Now, as we said, there's some theological things that you need to see. And this is where it gets really fascinating with Thomas More and William Tyndale. Obviously, you've already learned um, that the offices up there are different, okay? Um, but under Christ's gospel, we find out that the office of elder is superior to the office of priest because you have elders ordaining priests. We also find out in the Book of Mormon, priests and elders um, <clears throat> had to be ordained. didn't matter whether they were under the Mosaic law or in the gospel of Christ. They were ordained and set apart. Um, other passages explain that there's a real power in these ordinations, which obviously Tyndale didn't believe. And then um, other reasons why Tyndale was opposed to ordained order of priests is because he was upset that they were standing in between believers and their God. And the Book of Mormon clearly teaches that salvation comes through the merits of Christ and not <clears throat> through some other mediator or means. 
Tyndale was upset that the duties of priests was um, to do all these sacred ceremonies and not actually teach people the word of God. Uh, the Book of Mormon makes it very plain that duties of priests and elders were to preach and teach the word of God and to administer saving ordinances. Tyndale also argued that the clergy were joining the clergy to have a job and that they didn't intend to live up to the high standards of their priestly office. Well, the Book of Mormon text explains that priests are not consecrated, except they'd already proven themselves to live faithfully, justly, and righteously, and with continual repentance. There's also instructions on how to handle members of the church, including priests or elders who violated commandments and refused to repent. Tyndale also argued that the Catholic priests always made themselves holier than lay people and used that position to get money off of the lay people and treat them as lesser individuals. Well, Book of Mormon makes it clear. The priests are not to esteem themselves above other church members. The preacher was no better than a hearer, neither was the teacher any better than the learner. We also have very bold teaching that the priestly office was not a professionally paid position, and priests were to work for their living in some other profession. So you look at all of these doctrinal engagements, and the Book of Mormon deals with more and Tyndale's issues on every level, and it doesn't leave anything unaddressed. Now, let's have a look at Ecclesia, this church and congregation. Now, the reason Tyndale liked congregation, he believed the congregation was a better word for defining the common people. Um, and the common people at the time all seemed to have thought that church just referred to the clergy, and he didn't want to use that word church for that reason. Now, he also thought congregation was a better fit for the widely varying degrees of faith in the believers, which you can kind of understand. But Tyndale's theology, he also believed that church should be reserved for those who kept their baptismal covenants versus people who didn't. So he had this church of the elect that he wanted to reserve the church word for. And then um, he also believed that church was a place to hear the word of God taught in your own language, not just a place to go and listen to Latin things. Um, which he had a problem with. Now, Tin, or Moore liked the word church because he thought it traditionally represented a group of Christians in the English language, and he's a traditionalist, so you have to remember that would uh, really bug him to, to get rid of that tradition. And he also recognized the church should be traceable all the way down from Christ's primitive church, and congregation just doesn't do that. Um, he thought church was led by men with traceable authority and not just a random congregation of people, and it should be recognized by its faith and good works. He rejected totally the idea of elect members because of people's free will, is what he called it. We would probably use the word agency. And uh, he thought church was not a place to hear the word of God, but it's a place to be changed through sacred ceremonies like watching the mass, Okay. Um, so they're very different here on their understanding of what Ecclesia should be. Now, let's look at what happens in later translations of the English Bible. It's fascinating. Bible translators up until the Great Bible follow Tyndale exactly, and they translate Ecclesia as congregation every time, 112 instances. So the word church does not appear in those New Testaments, okay? Um, that's up to 1540. Now, what's interesting is, by the time we get to Geneva, which is late 1550s, early 1560s, um, the translators suddenly start putting church back in, and they start getting rid of congregation. By the time we get to 1611, congregation only appears once, and church has replaced congregation totally. Now, um, I could explain this to you, but we don't have time for that, but another time. <laughs> What's going on politically in England has a lot to do with why that change happens. Um, but I just wanted you to see the mixed bag of results we've got there uh, with it. So what does the Book of Mormon do? Well, <laughs> church is used a lot more often than congregation. And when congregation is used, it's only used twice. And it's only used to refer to general groups of people and never to a body of Christians, which is really fascinating. Um, under the higher law, people who believe in Christ come together as a church, 
And even under the law of Moses in the Book of Mormon, they are calling themselves a church, uh, which is fascinating um, with the language. Now, theologically, let's have a look at how cool this is. Now, um, <coughs> let me find my where I'm at here. Let's see. Okay. Right. As you know, Book of Mormon people united in their belief in Christ, whether they were either law called themselves in churches. They also recognized that people had to be baptized to join this church under both laws, as you can see there in the Book of Mormon. It's baptism by immersion, by authority to enter into the church. Uh, we find out that nobody can be baptized until they come forth with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And it's describing this baptism as a two-way covenant between God and the individual. Um, service and keeping the commandments and then being blessed with the Spirit, um, as you guys know from sacrament prayers and things, is that baptismal covenant. Um, in the Book of Mormon, the Christian church was recognized by its authority, and it was traceable back to Christ himself and its teachings. It was also not noted by the way the members live their lives. Um, there's a clear and repeated message that authority to form a Christian church comes from one who's been ordained by God to have that power. The Book of Mormon also refutes the idea of an elect group of Christians by stating that all are alike unto God, that all children of men are invited to come into Christ if they choose to do so. And along with that doctrine of equality is the twin doctrine of agency taught so plainly, uh, which refutes this idea of predestination God created all things, both to act and things to be acted upon. And the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself and not be compelled. So membership in Christ Church was always freely available to those who chose and were willing to choose to keep their covenants. The Book of Mormon also explains what happens at church. The members meet together off to fast and pray, and they met off to partake of the sacraments and to be taught the gospel and to be reminded of the things that they need to be doing. Um, so that's good. And then <clears throat> as you look at all of these, every one of these issues was debated by William Tyndale and Thomas More. And you can clearly see that Joseph is not just copying from somewhere. Um, his doctrines are refreshing and in some cases disagree with More, sometimes disagree with Tyndale, and sometimes disagree with both of them and come up with something else. So copying, not going on there. Now agape, we have some problems with agape, and I just want to show you why love is a bit of a challenge. Um, we've talked about the Oxford English Dictionary, which tries to research the history of the English language. Sometimes it does a good job, and sometimes it doesn't, and some research has not been done on some words. But charity is one that we can trace back to the late 12th and early 13th centuries. And it means Christian love. And it was in, uh, designed to represent the caritas of the Vulgate Bible, to mean God loves to man, man's love to God, man's love to his fellow human beings. But what's so fascinating about charity is I hope you've noticed, you can't understand the word without using the word love. So we've got this one-way relationship between charity and love, which complicates it. But as you know, you don't understand love in terms of charity. So it's interesting. So this makes the appearance of charity and love in the Bible quite uh, interesting. Now, we also have a grammatical problem because charity does not have an active verb tense. Okay, Tyndale wrote this, charity God or charity your neighbor. You don't say that. You say love God and love your neighbor. So as we look at these two words, you've got to understand that love will appear more often naturally because of this one-way relationship that we've got here. So what did Tyndale do with it? Well, Tyndale <coughs> believed that the agape in the Greek represented... Oh, sorry, I'm starting with more. I usually <laughs> get Tyndale first. Okay, we'll start with more. Um, he thought that the agape in the Greek meant a godly type of love, virtuous and well-ordered. Um, he did not like the idea of using the word love because it was too common and it could be applied to material things or other people or even to sin and something, and he just thought that was appalling to use that word for God or anything godly. 
Um, he also recognized that charity had become associated with chastity over the years, and that this purity and this unselfishness and this lack of worldly lusts was very important to him in understanding what the word charity meant. Um, he also believed it was um, used to demonstrate acts of almsgiving and caring about other people. Now, Tyndale disagreed and said love, the agape, was too wide for this godly love. It was wider, and it applied to all types of love. Um, and he felt like the textual circumstances would always tell you what type of love was being meant, so you never had to be confused. And then um, he didn't like the idea that love or charity should be associated with this almsgiving or other virtues because he didn't think you had to earn your way to salvation. Kind of wanted to get rid of that idea. But he felt that love was better because it springs from a heart that's been touched by gratitude for the atonement and love was related to having faith in Jesus Christ. So again, theologically, they're in very different places. So what did later translators of the Bible do? Well, <laughs> they stick with Tyndale, okay? Uh, almost exclusively, and we'll talk about the King James Bible in just a minute. Um, Agape appears 252 times, and uh, it's translated as love, 242 of those. And some of you might be like, well, what are the other words? Um, they're things like dear and uh, other kinds of terms of endearment that don't really translate well as love, okay? But most of the time, we're using the word love there. Now, what happens in the King James Bible is fascinating. Uh, 1611, they decide to introduce charity back in. Uh, more often, it appears 29 times in the King James Bible, which isn't a lot, but it's a lot more than what you've got over here. Um, and interestingly, nearly half of those come from one chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. And I hope you all know that. Charity suffered long, and, and if you don't have charity or nothing, um, it's that lovely discourse. Now, what's so fascinating about this is that is the only theologically dense discourse where you'll find charity in the King James Bible. Every other theological discourse talks about love, and it's overwhelming. Um, so it's quite interesting to see why that 1 Corinthians 13 is there when every other chapter uh, uses the word love. So what does the Book of Mormon do? Look at that. Um, even though charity is not used as often, statistically, Charity appears more in the Book of Mormon than any of the other New Testament Bible translations of the 16th century. Um, it's quite amazing that we've got this. Now, what's even more amazing, as you know, charity is defined in terms of love. So look how the Book of Mormon defines it. The pure love of Christ. More would have loved that because pure is what he wanted. He doesn't want a worldly love. He wants a pure unselfish um, love to be directed at God and to other people. But it's also defined as everlasting love, perfect love, and simply as love. Um, but over here, we also find out that love is also important, and in one of the most uh, ideal societies ever written about, they don't say it was charity in the hearts of the people. It's love that's in the hearts of the people. So you see this beautiful blend of it's all right to use charity and love to mean this godly type of love, and the Book of Mormon does both, um, which is fascinating to me. Now, let me just give you a look at some of the theology <coughs> here really quick and catch up to myself. Um, and then, let's see, here we go. Okay. Okay. <coughs> If you remember, Tyndale really believed that um, love should issue from a heart that has had a spiritual change about it. He didn't like the idea of working for salvation by trying to earn it by doing good works, and he felt that people couldn't actually do any good works until they were motivated by the highest motivation, which is love. And so the Book of Mormon really engages with this, and it describes a spiritual process that had to take place in a person's heart you might know this from Isaiah 3.19. As you put off the natural man, which is an enemy to God, you then yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and become full of love. And then you can go out and obey the commandments. 
Um, there's a lot of examples of this kind of change in people in the Book of Mormon. Hopefully you can think of a few, but the prophet Alma described this kind of alteration in individuals he was teaching who were spiritually awakened by the atonement and by hearing the word of God, and then through the Spirit, these people changed, and they humbled themselves and willingly uh, obeyed the commandments. King Benjamin witnessed this kind of change in the people he preached to, and they describe it as no more disposition to do evil. Um, in spite of this overwhelming support for Tyndale's inward spiritual transformation, the Book of Mormon also teaches the vital importance of good works and how obedience to God's commandments gives individuals access to Christ's mercy. And this is what Thomas More was appreciative of. Um, there are many verses that teach that man does not merit anything of himself, but it's Christ who, whose merit we rely on, but he extends that merit to us through our conditions of repentance. And that is how we're able to have um, that saving grace um, is by repenting. So again, Book of Mormon engages deeply with every one of Moore and Tyndale's concerns over love and charity. So in conclusion, the Book of Mormon's language and theology connects extremely well to 16th century controversy between Moore and Tyndale. So what are we going to say? The Book of Mormon cannot accurately be portrayed as a mimic of 19th century theology with 17th century phrases thrown in. Um, its origins are much more extensive than that. And I would just like to argue <laughs> that the origins of the Book of Mormon are far beyond Joseph's own personal capabilities. I know he did not have access to Moore and Tyndale. Um, how did he know that um, he's inspired? And I just want to conclude by making that very clear, uh, that I believe that this book has divine origins. Um, and as you study the theology and the language, it's very evident that it does. So thank you very much for your time. Then, those of you who have questions, you write them on a card, um, and we'll collect those, and, uh, and then Dr. Martin will address those questions. Um, and while she's looking at the questions and organizing her thoughts, um, I'll just uh, offer my little summation here. Um, Dr. Martin has shared with me her hope that the audience will take two things away from her presentation, at least two things. The first is that language and theology are inseparable, and that understanding language is crucial for understanding the theology that's attached to it. Not all words, however, are equal in value. Some are theologically charged and even crucial when it comes to religious meaning. The second point is that a thorough examination of three pairs of theologically powerful words, priest and elder, love and charity, and church and congregation, will show the philological and theological complexities in the Book of Mormon and how these complexities engage deeply with philological and theological controversies from the 16th century. She hopes that the audience will recognize that an uneducated farm boy from upstate New York would have had a very hard time writing a book with this kind of philological and theological complexity in it unless he'd done a lot of study of the 16th century beforehand, which, by the way, seems extraordinarily unlikely in the case of Joseph Smith. Um, so once again, the bar, it seems to me, is set somewhat higher than it's been set before um, as, a, as a whole new set of uh, difficult to explain facts are amassed here. Um, so, um, how are we coming? Do I need a take off? Yeah. Okay, I love this. We have to start with this. <laughs> Who wins, Tyndale or more? <laughs> Do you know, I hope you could see in the Book of Mormon that they both have their moment. Um, and theologically, they both have a point. They both have something to offer. And so I think we have to say, in the Book of Mormon at least, it's a draw. Um, because I hope you saw in the language that sometimes it favors Tyndale, sometimes it's more, sometimes there's a lovely blend. Um, and doctrinally especially, you can see bits and pieces of each. 
um, in the Book of Mormon. And, and I can imagine both of them looking over the Book of Mormon at some point and going, oh, <laughs> okay, I was right about this, and uh, I wasn't right about that, and I hope they'd be humble enough to say that they weren't right about that. Uh, so I'll just have to say, um, Book of Mormon-wise, they both have their, their time um, being right. So, okay, next question. Are there any obvious similarities and differences between Campbell's revision of the Bible and Joseph Smith's? Um, I personally have not done an analysis on what Joseph's um, KJV translation was like and the, and the additions that he made um, and comparing that to Campbell's. Campbell did change some words and things and tried to make it more modern, but he obviously didn't have the capability of doing what Joseph did. Um, I'll have to ask and see if Royals looked more closely at Campbell's translation. I personally haven't. So I might have to get back to you on that and have a look. Um, I love looking at Bible translations, so that's not a problem. Um, but I don't really know because I've not done, I've not compared the two specifically, so I apologize. But that'll give me some more research to do. So that, that was nice. Um, this question is, would you comment on the grace versus favor dispute? including its relevance to justification and sanctification. Um, Thomas More and William Tyndale debated grace and favor, but not nearly as um, passionately as they debated the top words I showed you today. And that's why I chose those ones, because there's a lot more commentary on them. Um, grace versus favor has to do with um, their view of salvation and whether it was a free gift, which is what Tyndale was arguing, or whether you could actually earn it uh, which is what Tyndale kind of interpreted the Catholics to be. More was a bit more connected to the atonement and tried to argue that you couldn't be blessed um, with any rewards except through the atonement of Christ. And so he's trying to bring atonement in there. Um, so the grace versus favor is really just limited to one of them being grace, being free, and favor being something you're given for something that you did. Um, and they didn't really connect it to justification and sanctification themselves. Those were not terms that Moore and Tyndale really worried about. Um, so can't really go there on that question, so hopefully that's okay. Um, this is just a lovely comment, and I'm just going to let you hear it because it made me smile. <laughs> Can you imagine in the spirit world Moore and Tyndale? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, both gathering on perhaps a committee formed to translate the Book of Mormon into English. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine that. And I've actually thought that a lot listening to Stan and thinking about how this Book of Mormon may have been translated. And if it was done by committee, you can bet at least Tyndall would have been there. <laughs> um, and I imagine Moore would have had something to say because he's quite... Uh, Got a strong personality with lots of opinion. Okay, last question. Got more on this. Oh, sorry. Got How much time do I have? I don't want to go over. About two, two or three minutes. Okay, <laughs> let me look. <laughs> it's a great, a great question. You guys are fantastic. Okay, has your research prompted any of your colleagues at the University of York to take the Book of Mormon seriously? Do you know what? All this research I've done on the Book of Mormon has since been leaving, since I left uh, York University. Um, but I did have a really nice conversation with my supervisor about the Book of Mormon um, and why. I'll just have to give you a little background. He was afraid that my testimony of the Bible was going to be destroyed if I looked too much into its history. <laughs> <laughs> So we had this really long, it was so funny, he was gearing up for this serious talk because he's a member of the Church of England and he didn't want my faith to be shaken and got all serious and was looking at me and, and I just said, well, you don't need to worry about it. And he's like, well, why not? Well, I just said, we don't believe the Bible is infallible. In fact, we believe it has lots of errors and that's why we got the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and he's like, oh, and I said, so don't worry about it. My faith isn't going to be shaken if the Bible's got problems, I already know that. Um, so I did have a chance of kind of trying to plug the Book of Mormon that way, but most of my Book of Mormon research has been done since I left uh, University of York. But once I get it published out there, I'll be sure to send it along <laughs> um, so they can hear about it. And then, okay, this is a good question, and I was wor uh, not worried, but I figured someone would bring this one up. 
these issues we've talked about have been Catholic Protestant divisions, um, I think it says forever, for centuries? Okay, for centuries. Why focus just on Martin Tyndale? Uh, mostly because this is a 16th century conference. <laughs> and, uh, but you're right, these have been issues in the Catholic Protestant Church for a long time, but you have to remember Protestant churches didn't come into existence until the 1500s. So this is really a 16th century uh, issue. Martin Luther was late or early 1500s, and that's when the first Protestant stuff really started happening. So if we take it all the way back to the beginning with Martin Tyndale, then there's a lot more research that needs to be done theologically with 17th century and 18th century and following these issues out. But they really do start in the 16th century. Um, that's where our first Protestants come from. Okay, and last one. We done? Two more there. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, I'm just having trouble reading some handwritings. <clears throat> Can't read that one, sorry. Okay. Okay, this one says, the Book of Mormon does not seem to have a single monolithic theology, as it is an amalgamation of various beliefs and practices. Okay. Um, do you notice any organization in the Book of Mormon between the ideas of Tyndale and Moore? For example, certain narrators or voices which are more Tyndalean or Morian. That's an excellent question. Do you know what was so funny is the word priest comes up more in First and Second Nephi than anywhere else. Okay, it was quite amazing how heavily weighted it is toward the front and then toward the back of the Book of Mormon, hardly mentioned at all. I think when you saw it there under the higher law, there's only six or seven references to it. So um, considering the trouble we had in the Bible trying to decide how Christ's church is organized and what leadership it's got, the Book of Mormon doesn't really help you um, at the end of it. So yes, there's, there's definitely a leaning with the word priest didn't notice that so much with church at all or with charity, um, but priest is certainly one of those um, that's like that. Um, so, yeah. Okay, we good? And the rest of these I will try and email you if you'd like, and I'll try and decipher what they say. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate your time. <laughs>